Hello and welcome to Balliol College Online. Um, this, I, my name's Pravahi. I'm the person who leads the outreach activities and events here. Can I just ask you if you've got your microphone on to check and to put it on mute for the moment? So tonight we're going to be looking at scientific literacy and we're lucky to have two graduates who are going to share their knowledge, experience and research with you on this topic. It's a subject that you don't really explore much at college, but it's certainly really important as you move into higher education. Um, I'm hoping that when you were sent the link, you also got the articles which are going to be referred to during this session. Um, and just to remind you, we are recording this session, so everyone who's here will get this, so you can go back to it along with the articles after the session. Um, if you happen to be on our Frontier Science Programme, you will meet uh, Juana and Rhea again, because they will be leading separate sessions on that programme. If not, you're lucky to meet them tonight. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Um, we are just going to share the presentation. Give us a few seconds. OK. Um, and. Uh, let's see. OK. Um, so, uh, Rhea, well, if you could uh, start. Sorry. Uh, um, I think I, yeah, I think I should have taken control, but I don't know why yeah. it's not. Yeah, it doesn't allow me to. <laughs> Wait, maybe provide, maybe we, or uh, actually I'll just, I'll just tell you to click and you, you can click for me. It's yeah, fine. that's perfect. I think that um, <laughs> you should have control now. Okay, okay, perfect. Great, perfect. Cool, cool, cool. All right, so uh, well, welcome everyone to uh, this reading scientific literature uh, small intro. Uh, so we'll be together for the next one and a half hours and um, we're going to be introducing ourselves first and what the session is going to be about. But before we dive in, I just wanted to let you know that uh, we want to make this session super casual and comfortable for you guys. So whenever you like whatever thoughts you have or whatever questions are, as we're presenting, please feel free to put them in the chat and um, we, we'd love to hear from you as we go on, obviously. So without further ado, let me check that I can um, move the slide one. I don't think I can. Uh, maybe one, if you just, just click it for me. This is the work. Great, perfect, cool. OK, so I'm going to be introducing myself first. So my name is Rhea. I'm originally from Albania. I am a recent graduate of the Master of Engineering Molecular Bioengineering program from Imperial College London. And I have just started my DPhil or PhD, as we call it, in physiology, anatomy and genetics at the Stevens Group um, at the University of Oxford. My research interests involve immune engineering, biomaterials, tissue engineering, drug delivery, and my PhD project is uh, developing a cell based cure for type 1 diabetes. Why are you muted? What I, I think you're still muted. Yeah, OK, perfect. Um, I think that it got confused between the arrows in the presentation and OK. So I'm Juana. I'm finishing my PhD at the moment, writing my thesis. Uh, I'm originally from Romania um, and I came to the UK to study physics at the University of Manchester and then I came to Oxford for my PhD and I'm doing quantum computing with trapped ions. So with, I'm an ion trapper and you can see in, in this image here, like while my face is not 
uh, is not a very good picture of myself, but you can see the ions in the back. So this is a picture that we took uh, just before the Christmas break where we trapped some ions for the first time um, in a new setup. And basically we use these ions as a platform for uh, doing a, um, for creating a quantum computer. And we also work a lot with lasers and atomic physics trying to understand um, ions. Okay, so we should, um, as Rhea mentioned uh, earlier and also Pravahi, you should have received um, some articles from us. And the idea is that we are going to uh, mention examples from them uh, during this presentation. And you are very encouraged to try to ask um, questions and also like try to, um, if something is not clear, um, like just make sure that you stop us. Um, okay, and we are also going to have a short break at some point. Okay, so let's start uh, now. Okay, so the presentation um, is organized. First, we are going to look at what it means, like what is the meaning of a paper, then components of the paper, how to read the paper. We are going to do a reading exercise, and then we are going to present some very important tools um, that help you with managing um, your literature. So like this meaning, like when you read multiple articles and you want to keep track of them, but also how to find the articles that are more relevant to uh, to your work. Okay, so uh, let's get started. Uh, what is a paper? Or what is a scientific article? Well, this is a written document and it's written by scientists or by uh, people that are profession uh, that are uh, professionist in a um, certain field or that have studied for a long time in that field and they are um, they themselves learn more about a certain scientific topic, but they also have uh, a lot of expertise. And the article is meant to communicate a finding, uh, a finding of their scientific research or scientific study. And what is very important is that this article is peer reviewed. What does this mean is that when um, you have in written form your results, you are going to send it to a journal. And then if the journal decides that they want to uh, accept your article or uh, they want to investigate it more, then they are going to take uh, some other experts in the field and have a look at this article. And this ensures that scientists are doing a good job and that um, the way they think about it is um, the way they think about a certain problem is properly assessed and it's always good um, to get um, idea uh, to get um, feedback from different points of view. Um, also the scientific research and what it is very important is like it can take multiple years and then like it, it can take quite a bit of time to also write about your results. So it's it is okay like if when you saw maybe the articles, you found that they are quite intimidating. And this is because a lot of people put a lot of work into it. OK, so one other important thing is the uh, article type. So this, um, depending on the article type, uh, the way it is written might change. So these are the most common ones, and these are the ones that you also had to basically look at. So one of them is a research article. So this presents um, original research and reports new work. Um, while like, for example, like the other article that you look, uh, looked at, the uh, review article, doesn't have no new data. It basically just looks at previous um, research articles and does a summary in order to uh, present an idea about um, how, where is the field going? What has been done so far? What are the current problems um, now? But there are also other um, article types. So some of them might be a systematic review. Uh, so for example, uh, this can be, um, instead of comparing to uh, just a review article, this is, um, this is going, in more detail and is looking at the data, analyzing the data, comparing them against many articles. And this is done very commonly, for example, in 
med scene, like when you want to see um, the treatments, for example, for a certain uh, disease, how they evolved over time. There is also the potential of doing a case study. And here, like you look uh, at a specific uh, study group, and for example, like you look, you can look at, uh, this is also very commonly used in uh, medicine, like you can look at, for example, um, the um, eating behaviors of certain people, or like, I don't know, the, um, um, their physical activity and so on and uh, so forth. But the most, uh, like what you should take from here is that the most common ones are the research articles, which show original re uh, results and then review articles, uh, which gives you, uh, give you a, comp a comprehensive summary of a research area. And Mona, if I may add, like while we're, st while we're still here, so the idea for this session is obviously for you guys, as some of you may, you know, want to venture into like a scientific career or um, anything like that. So as scientists, a lot of our work revolves around, you know, I like, I'm sure you've like, you must have heard how uh, the saying goes about like standing in the shoulders of giants, as in the case of like using work that is been done by people before you and then kind of trying to like make iterations or improvements upon it so it's very like staying on top of the literature in your field becomes very important um, in your scientific career so for example when you're going into a new project and you don't know much about it right so the first thing that you would normally do is read a couple of review articles because they tend to be very good at giving you a background and like good foundational knowledge of the fields and also people who write these review articles tend to be like you know a lot of um, have kind of like a lot like knowledge of a lot of interrelated fields so it's really good you know when you start doing your literature search and then as you have this as, as you start building this foundational knowledge then you jump into research articles which tend to be a lot more specific so look into like one uh, specific research question but having had that you know foundational background knowledge from a review article it makes it a lot easier to understand jargon and uh, make sense of the data and like the research questions and like tools that um, scientists are using in research articles yeah um, i completely agree with this and um, also like with respect to this is also each article and we are going to discuss more about it in a few minutes also like at the end of the article you have a list of references where basically the researchers put all the work that they found um, relevant in writing their own research and in a way like this also gives credibility to the research because you know um, or like it gives credibility of the presented work because you know what is going on in the field okay um, and maybe you saw on the articles um, that we sent to you, maybe you saw um, science robotics or nature physics. These are names um, of the journals in which you pu can publish, and there are so many out there. But I think that one important aspect uh, that we wanted to mention is that depending on the journal, for example, like if the, it is science or nature, um, these, for example, are um, articles that would be presented um, from, a, um, would try to give you, instead of trying to focus on the topic, would try, would try to give you um, a big picture idea. Why is this research important from a big picture idea? And they are considered to be more impactful paper papers because like in a way they are more impactful journals because they um, basically um, if the research is relevant to multiple people then multiple people are going to consider it relevant in their research and they are going to cite it so it might be easier sometimes to start with an article um, in this journal, in such journals, because they give you in the inter in the introduction, they would give you like a um, um, bigger image uh, overview about the field. While um, um, articles such as for, um, journals such as Physics Review Letters, they tend to focus on a certain problem, and you'll see that sometimes, like if you, for example, like 
decide to investigate the problem in more detail, it might come to, it might uh, be for you that you see that these articles are more relevant because they focus much better on a certain problem and also like give more technical details. Um, so this is what is a paper. Um, if there are any questions now, like you can, I don't know if there is anything in the chat at the moment or like if you want to raise your hand and say something, I think that this is a good time for this. And Anyway, no question is too basic, you know, I mean, we're, we're yes. well aware. before you start undergrad, you basically see almost close to like no scientific literature at all. At least I hadn't uh, when I was doing high school. So whatever question you guys have, like, uh, please feel free to just drop it in the chat and we'll be super happy to discuss it more. Um, OK, so now let's move on to components of a paper, because this is very important when to know about when you want to um, when you want to actually go about um, and and read your paper. So, like the first thing that you see is the title: um, Quantum Biology in this case and Robotic Metamorphosis by Origami Skeletons. And this is the first window into the article, and um, it provides the main idea, what is going to be about, and scientists spent a lot of time choosing their um, titles because they want to make sure that they have the keywords that would resonate with people and then people would decide to go and read the article. Um, and depending how technical um, the, um, it might be that an article has a very technical title and it just depends on who the audience is. Um, then um, we have, Sorry, um, before we move on, um, there's one question in the chat and uh, another thing yeah. I was going to add to the title thing. So with the title, as one I was saying, basically, uh, researchers try to be very strategic because as we're going to see later in the presentation, I'm going to go um, through how you start to do literature search and what you use is keywords, right? So as a scientist who's publishing a paper, uh, what you want to do is like reach as much of, uh, you know, as much of your target audience as possible. So you want to make sure you're hitting as many of those keywords as possible, obviously. Um, and regarding the question, uh, the question says this is more about terminology, but is there a difference between a paper and an article or are they different names for the same thing? So paper, um, we, we refer to papers as basically publications and a research or like an article, like for example, a research article is one kind of paper, but a review article, you know, is another type of paper. So I would say that a research article is like a subclass of papers but yeah paper is like a generic way of referring to them basically and we can i think that also like saying paper is more of a jargon that is used among um scientists probably like the best way to say it is like it's a scientific article what we are talking about today is reading scientific articles um but i think that that was a very good question um okay then uh, you might see the author list. And it depends from, <clears throat> um, from field to field, there might be different conventions. Um, but usually, uh, for example, um, you see that um, you would um, you would see here under, there are also some institutions. So these are the institutions from where the scientists are. Um, and then you might see here corresponding author. Um, and this is, I would say that this is one of the most important things from here because it basically allows you to, um, like if you have any questions about the article, like this is the person that you should uh, email. Um, then in terms of how the authors are ordered, like this is very, um, this is once again specific to the field, but usually what happens is that the first, um, the last author is the, what is called the principal investigator. So this is the person that came up with the idea for the project. They are the person who managed the students to do this project. And then the first uh, name here is usually like the person who did the most. And some articles might even have um, at the end contribution list and they might explain what each author has done. 
Um, but um, I put here a uh, questions, what happens with big collaboration like CERN? So this is the um, particle physics collaboration. Being a physicist, unfortunately, I'm a bit biased towards this. So here I just find it always very funny because there are thousands and thousands of people working across the world. So like what they do in articles, they basically um, arrange them alphabetically and they say that there are they are a collaboration and it's a bit harder to figure out um, who did the majority of the work, but in a way like also being part of a collaboration is like each one does a bit to for the entire group to go forward. Um, and then, um, yeah, so this is uh, the person um, uh, I mentioned earlier, the corresponding author, which I think for me, like this would be the most important thing in case uh, I don't understand uh, something in the paper and I would want to know more. Okay. Um, and this, as mentioned before, is um, if you ask yourself now, like there is this huge list of authors who, who actually wrote the paper, usually is the first uh, author on the list, but you can also say, uh, you can see in the contribution list that usually is the first person and then uh, with um, contributions from all the authors. Because as we said before, um, an article, writing an article um, has ba basically like is the result of a lot of people contributing towards um, the final results and also giving feedback along the way. Um, and for example, let's say that maybe there are people that haven't worked on the research project necessarily, but they gave uh, just feedback. Uh, they gave some ideas about the work. You can thank them in the acknowledgements. And also like in the acknowledgement section, um, you can also put, for example, for from where the funding is. So um, this is why, like, for example, they are saying that they are thanking for financial support here. So these are more like just for you to know like what are these things um, on on the paper is not necessarily very important in terms of reading the article, but if you ask yourself. Um, and then we go towards like the most important components now. So just under the title, uh, you would find uh, the abstract. And usually this is um, in a way that you could observe it is either in bold text or like it's a separate paragraph. And I don't know if Rea agrees with me, but I would say that this is one of the most important uh, parts of the article. And once again, people spent a lot of time uh, writing it. So this is meant to summarize the most important finding, uh, findings of the article. And what happens very often, uh, for example, like when um, when I'm reading um, or like when I'm trying to decide if an article has something that is relevant for my work, um, I basically read the abstract and then decide if I want to continue um, or not. So um, that's why like usually people want it to be like very interesting and want to uh, tell you how the work is different from what has been done before, what is the progress? And that's why they would also give you a bit of context of the world and um, of the um, field at that point, and also like what is the um, um, what is the solution that is provided, for example, in in the research article. It's kind of like I don't know why, like the way I tend to think about it is just the most concentrated form that you can write your whole paper in. So when you read the abstract, like you should. Basically, the authors should have conveyed the context of the problem they're trying to solve um, in a very like in a very concentrated form. What is current like the state of the art, as we say, or like the most advanced method of like tackling a certain problem, how they're adding to it, like the most important pieces of data, or, like results they got from this and how this fits into the bigger picture of the field. So. You can imagine like to write all these components in a paper, it takes a couple of pages at least if you're writing a paper or if you're writing if it's your thesis, because obviously like you can have the abstract of a paper, but also for example, when it comes to writing your master's thesis or like your PhD thesis, uh, you're going to have an abstract of that as well. So you can imagine like 
summarizing, let's say, 300 pages of worth of work into like one paragraph. So it does definitely like every word counts and like every word is precious. So yeah, it is the most concentrated version that you can fit the whole body of work that you've done in basically. And also like from the journals, depending on the journals, there is also a limit of words on it. So you can't, you are really forced to constant, uh, to like try to concentrate as much as possible um, your research. And it's also like, you can think about it that this is, if it is written properly, um, is basically um, going to be like what, what the, um, the authors, what um, is going to be basically what the authors of the article want you um, to learn from this, like it's like, what are the most important things? Um, okay, so also figures. Um, and I think that this, I found this um, uh, quote like quite <laughs> fitting. A picture is worth uh, a thousand words, is more a figure, uh, is worth a thousand words. And this, you can really use figures to try to enhance your research and try to explain the problem um, through a visual representation. And it's also quite funny, actually, that also like in uh, the journals, there is usually an equivalent of the number of words for a certain figure. So if you make your figure too big, like they would say like, ah, oh, it's too many words. It's considered that is equivalent to too many words. Um, Okay, and what kind of figures um, can you have in a, um, in, an, an, in a scientific article? It basically can be whatever makes your, um, makes you um, present uh, your results in a better way. So like the most common ones are like you measure some data uh, and you are just plotting it um, in a graph. Then it might be that you want to describe a theoretical um, a theoretical process, um, or it might be that you want to present simulation or theory data, or it might just be a diagram of a setup or a process that you did um, in the lab. So this can be whatever, uh, as I said earlier, enhances and helps you um, make your research more accessible and make, um, helps you explain your results better. Then with each figure, um, there comes a caption and there are uh, different schools of thought here. Sometimes people say that a, uh, a picture should be, a figure together with its caption should be everything that you need uh, to know in order to underst uh, understand the figure. So in principle, you should not have to read more in the text, but uh, there is also like definitely the case um, that people might just give you an indication of what it is in the figure and then the majority of the explanation is going to be in the text. Um, okay, and then we are going to go to the main body. So here there are multiple components. So um, introduction, conclusion, discussion, outlook, and then results, theory, methods, um, and it can also differ depending on the field. Um, and then there can be also uh, sections that have names that are specific to uh, the respective article. And it might be hard sometimes to figure out where the introduction is because once again, depending on the journal, they might discuss to put the title of the introduction uh, or the conclusion, um, but sometimes you are going to be able to figure it out because for example, like in the introduction, you are going to have um, passages, like for example, they are going to give you, um, they are going to mention um, here we are doing this. So then you know that you are in the, inter in the inter introduction. And they, or like when you go to the conclusion, they might say like in conclusion here, we did all of these things. So you would not need to necessarily have um, um, titles for your, um, 
for your uh, different sections, you are going to be able to figure it out. Okay, so out of all of this, um, we are going to discuss about um, the introduction and the conclusion, um, because once again, these are parts of the paper that will give you like the most about what is going on. Looking over the results and the theory, this is going to allow you um, to understand in detail what experiments or what processes they did or how they analyze the data. And this might be important if, for example, you want to uh, do the experiment yourself. However, like if you want to understand the most about the scientific article, the introduction and the conclusion might be the most important ones. So what, what is it going to be in the introduction? <clears throat> so this is meant to give you a big overview about what's happening, like the, st uh, the status quo, um, what, what is happening at the moment um, in the field, and what are the trends, what are the questions that people want to answer, and also like it's meant to highlight what is a knowledge gap. Um, and also, like in order to be possible to do this, um, it usually has included a broad literature review. So you are going to see that the majority of the references that are given will be usually in the introduction. Is and this is meant um, for making sure that the information that is put in the introduction um, is really like uh, backed up, but what by what other people. Did, and it's not something that the, just the scientist thinks about the field. It's really facts. It's just summarizing what other people have done and giving the references. Um, and then what is then the most important is that it's going to introduce what it has been done, uh, what, uh, what will be done in the work that they are presenting. And as I said before, they are also presenting a knowledge gap. So when they are presenting this knowledge gap, um they are going to uh basic their their article is meant to bridge that knowledge gap so for example in this case they are mentioning here we contribute to the concepts of robot metamorphosis using exoskeletons so this is the uh, robot uh, the engineering paper and then in the um, review article uh, here we present a brief overview of some of these cases and um, in this way, they show how they are going to bridge the knowledge gap or like what is needed in the field. Um, the concluding paragraph, uh, the concluded uh, paragraph. So this can be, um, depending on the journal, it can shift, but usually the main thing that it will do, it will provide you with a summary of all the work that has been presented. So for you, like if you want to figure out what they did differently compared to other articles, you are going to read the conclusion and there you are going to find the main points um, of the research. Also, um, they might discuss the next steps. So given that now they managed to do this aspect, what are the next things that they can do with the uh, knowledge that they gathered? And also like they will probably also present a discussion of what are the implications on the field now that this thing is uh, known and it has been researched. Um, and some examples here are, uh, for example, this study introduces the possibility of developing a robot uh, that can extend and switch its capabilities. Um, and then in the review article, they basically say that they return to the initial question um, in the, introdu in the um, introduction and they evaluate how the review has answered this question. Um, so with this in mind, I think that we can take now a five minute break so we can come back at uh, 10 past five. Um, and then we are going to do a reading exercise. Be basically being aware now of all the components uh, in the article. Um, in, OK, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. I was just going to say if anyone has any questions, like now would also be a great time to put them in the chat so that when we return, 
uh, after five minutes, we can um, address the questions and then move on to the reading exercise. Sounds good? Yeah? Great. Okay, so I think that there are quite, um, I saw only two questions um, in the chat. So one of them was what uh, is the difference between the abstract and, uh, and the introduction, which is a very good question. Um, so probably in terms of um, meaning is not such a big difference. So the abstract is going to be usually shorter, but it also still wants to give you, um, they it would usually give you what is the context 
of the um, uh, field at the moment by um, pointing to you what is the knowledge gap and then how is the um, uh, research article or their results, how is it bridging this uh, gap? A gap and is also going to give you a summary of the most important results. While the introduction basically it's longer and it just takes the time, like the scientists take the time giving you the context, presenting you what are the problems, how some other people maybe they uh, they try solving the problems and what is the solution that is provided by the, um, uh, the current article. And usually in the abstract, you also don't have uh, references. So it's going to be mainly in the introduction. So there is like where really they give you the uh, background and the current situation um, in the field. So in principle, also the introduction should um, make you understand, like um, should make you feel even more why the problem that they are discussing is important uh, to the field. Um, and then uh, the second one was like, if we uh, recommend now reading review articles or research papers. Um, I think that definitely if you want to get an overview, as Rhea mentioned earlier, if you just want to get a feel for a certain field, probably a review article um, is better. However, it might also be that the field is very young and there might not be that many review articles um, out there. And definitely trying to practice reading also a research article um, is also like it will get better with time and usually the introduction should give you some pointers of where you should go and read more in order to understand more about the field. Maybe you are not going to um, understand um, the research method that they used or how they did their measurements, but the, it should be enough to give you an idea of um, what, is, um, what is the problem, um, what are the main concepts that one should understand in order to go go further? It's also, I would say, by the way, I totally agree. And sorry, guys, these are really good questions, by the way. Um, so I would also say it's also a quite like a question of the purpose, right? So like, what is my purpose right now? Do I want to gain like a broad understanding of a certain field? Like, for example, the quantum biology paper which is a review article like it gives you you know an overview of like many like many ongoing studies right whereas if you're doing for example at this stage of your education like I know a lot of programs they have kind of like their own mini research projects so if you're doing something like that and you have a hypothesis or you have a study that you want to undertake and you want to go into the literature and see for example how people have done it before so like what if you want to find out like what concentration of reagents they're using or you know those nitty gritty like method details you will not find it in a research article like the in a review article you can only find that like in a research article um because review articles are not normally going to be as like detailed so if your particular project is such that you need to find out like what kind of method to use, what kind of instruments, what kind of reagents and that kind of stuff. That's always, you know, in the like in the research, like primary research articles. Uh, the other question about any good websites that you recommend to find informative articles or journals, that is exactly what we're going to go um, to work. We're, we're going to talk about right in the end of the presentation. So stay tuned about that. I don't want to, you know, introduce any spoilers. <laughs> Um, so there was also a raised hand from Alexis. Is this uh, the question from them? It was, by, yeah. it was by accident. They just put it in the chat. Yeah. OK, cool. OK, so now we can go back to uh, the presentation and we are going to do a reading exercise. And um, we didn't have I we chose to talk about one of the articles and the plan is basically that you can then go and apply these techniques for the other article that you received. So reading an article, it can be very intimidating. And um, because there is a lot of jargon, unfortunately, this is maybe what we are not doing very well as scientists that like usually like you go in a field and you learn certain words 
and then you are not trying to explain them in a better way. Like you are just using the same words because in your head they are associated with um, those things, uh, with a certain meaning. Um, and then like, I don't, um, I think that we, it would be also now good to also ask you why you find it intimidating or like if you found the papers, um, the articles that we sent you intimi intimidating, like why, why was that? Well, yeah. while, you are, while, while you guys are typing stuff in the chat, just to give you a little bit of time, um, it's very funny, Juana, because, uh, well, we say at least in our fields, uh, you know, people joke about the fact that researchers try to, like, write their papers or publications such that they impress each other with the language that they're using rather than trying to convey ideas in a way which is understandable and like clear to a more generic audience. So it is definitely a problem in, well, in my field, but like I think in science in general, that people use big words when things could be explained really clearly and easily. Uh, but yeah, Sam says they were very long and visually dense, which absolutely, Sam, I agree. It's a huge problem. And trust me, you think that you know, you say, oh, maybe I'm in high school, maybe because it's, um, you know, I don't understand enough. Well, trust me, I say, well, I'm in my first year of PhD. Maybe it's because I've just started and I don't understand enough. And well, I don't know if it gets better as you uh, move along, but trust me, like every time you read, you start reading a paper, there's barely any cases when I read a paper and I'm like, I understood 100% of this, right? So it hasn't happened for me yet. Maybe you want to like, you're smart and maybe it has, it's happened for you, but um, it, it is there be a problem absolutely i think that as you advance in your phd like you get definitely more specialized in the field but um i think that it's always good to go and humble yourself and then take an article from a different field and then yeah. like basically see that even though like it's let's say that for us like we we use ions and let's go and um, let's say and go go and read an article about atoms that are just i don't know atoms without an electron or with all the electrons in and it's already like becoming more difficult and there are things that are more specific to that field um so yeah it's definitely very very intimidating and, and especially but, yeah. yeah sorry uh -huh. um yeah uh, what i wanted to say is also like that what you also need to remember is that writing a uh, an article takes a long time it takes a long time to do the research and then it takes a long time to um, to write the article. So like this is, you should just remember that it's a very condensed summary of years of work of multiple people. So it's going to be um, maybe not as straightforward to understand it from first go. Yeah. Absolutely. And especially it also depends, as one I was saying, it also depends a lot on the field. So I have a bioengineering background and for you who are going to be on the uh, frontiers of science program we're going to discuss this in more detail but bioengineering is essentially really interdisciplinary right because you get a scientific background so in my undergrad i've done mechanics like electrical engineering but i've also done maths biology you know like all these different kinds of stuff so you get a lot of breadth but not as much depth so when you go there and you read a paper which is really specialized into a certain field it's really rare that you're going to have enough background to understand things in so much depth. But yeah, I'm looking at the comments as you guys are bringing them through and like absolutely like abbreviations are coming up, uh, the flow. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, someone's Sam is saying, I suspect that as one gets to know people, colleagues in their field, reading one other's articles would be more fun because you know the personalities behind them. This is also very true. It's always special to like see articles from friends or from like people you know personally. That's always fun. Um, another thing in this discussion is that scientists are not necessarily good writers, so you can mm -hmm. communicating science is a skill and a talent in itself because you may be very good at executing experiments in a lab and you may be great at that, but you're not necessarily going to be good at then when you go home, like your mom asks you and my mom has nothing to do with science, you know, it's always a challenge to like explain what I'm doing in the lab which is very specialized in a way that people who don't have like a scientific background beyond high school can understand as well. So and again, I haven't really taken any like scientific writing classes during my undergrad, so it's definitely like an issue that people are trying to 
put resources and time into so like training scientists to not just be good scientists, but also good scientific communicators, whether it's in writing papers or also like communicating to, you know, to a broader audience. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I think that also like a lot of the um, how to how do you learn to uh, to write a paper comes from your peers. So if you have the chance to work with uh, people that have been in the field for longer, um, and then um, there is also uh, the aspect of uh, just you reading more papers. So just seeing how people presented certain research and seeing like for example like if you felt that it was a good way in which they explained, if you understand it when they explained it in a certain way. So it's definitely also like a process through which you get better, like same with reading, but same also with uh, with writing. And I think that it's a very good, like you should ask yourself um, what would do, like when you read a, uh, an article, like what would, could have been done better in order for you to understand. Uh, more and just have this continuous um, feedback loop with yourself. But um, in terms of like making it less intimidating to read um, scientific articles, there are tools out there. And um, the one that is the most well known um, across um, different fields and just in the academic community is called the three pass method. Um, and it basically has to do with the fact that a scientific article has to be written multiple times and you can decide which parts to read um, when. And also like this, the three pass method. Uh, so it's not about just trying to understand everything from one go, just sitting at the table and just reading, uh, like reading very attentively because um, as uh, you said, like it's very, the, infor the information is very dense. Um, and also like this is just an example, like uh, what it is very important is that you should uh, tailor it for yourself and you should make it the nth pass method. Like if you need to do it two times, fine, you do it two times. If you need to do it 10 times, well, like you do it 10 times and that's okay. Like whatever works best for you. So for the um, three uh, pass method. So the first pass method should take uh, around 10 minutes, should be the shortest one. And um, it should include you looking at the title, uh, reading the abstract uh, in detail, uh, glance over the figures, the tables, highlighted text. So for example, like the highlighted text, this could be um, the, um, if some of the subsections have titles, for example, because then you could see like, oh, they are very interested in this topic. Or some sometimes people write certain words uh, in italic form. So then you understand that this is something that is important. It's an important uh, concept. And then you go to the conclusion. And basically, as we said before, this is a summary of the results that are, um, or um, this is going to be the results, the summary of the results is going to be in the abstract, but in the conclusion, they are going to give you a bit more information about how it was done and why this work is important for the field. And this is meant to give you a broad understanding about uh, like what is the article about, what is the main topic of the article, and what were the objectives and what were the major find, uh, findings. You might not be able to say how they measured a certain thing or why this is so relevant for the field, but you are going to get an idea about, oh, this concept is important, it was researched here. Um, and to be honest, like quite a, um, in the majority of the times, like this is um, where I stop with reading articles. It's basically, I get an idea that, okay, like this is what they are talking about and this is what they are interested. Um, and then uh, there is the second pass. So now um, you do what you did in the first pass, but then look at the introduction and also look at the figures in detail and read the captions. As we said before, like the, um, the figures with the caption should be self-sufficient. So they should give you like um, an idea about, for example, a certain process um, or like their setup. Um, and then what I 
forgot to mention before is that if there are any terms that you haven't that you were not able to understand um, at this point, you should go and look them up. In this way, you are going to get the best understanding of um, of the respective parts of the paper. Um, and um, for example, we said here that you need to, like you would go to the introduction. So what will happen is that in the introduction, you are going to find um, a, lot of um, a lot of references. So it's sometimes good to look over those references to see that, for example, if there is something that you read from before and um, or like if there is, oops, um, or if there is, um, um, for, um, or if there is a concept that you don't understand very well, then you can go and be like, oh, are they giving any references where they explore this concept more in more detail? And then you can go find that references, uh, reference and then um, go um, in depth about it. And this will give you a, com a comprehensive understanding of like why they designed the um, study, like why is it important for the field and where does it fit in? Um, and for example, like there was the case before, I'm not going to go through all the slides, there was the case before that in the robotics, um, um, uh, in the robotics article, uh, the captions were very short and they didn't give a lot of information. So what you can do, uh, go then, so usually the figure is numbered, it's like figure one. You can then go and look for where they are talking about um, figure one in the text, in the main text, and you can read there. Like you can make this a part of your process. Um, and this should take like all of the second pass should take around one hour. And then the, um, uh, the third pass or as many as you need is to read the, enti uh, the entire um, article. And usually like you want to do this when you want to, in a way, maybe recreate the study. Like you want to understand it to a level where you could recreate in principle the results. And a good article should give you all the information that you need in order to be able to recreate uh, the results. Um, and it's not, this is maybe like a good point to, um, Ask yourself, like, what when you are reading articles, what is that you want from an article? Like, do you want to understand it very well because it's important for the research that you are doing? Um, and then, like, you need to understand every single detail, how much solution they used here, how much power of the laser they used here in order to do this? Or do you just want to get an understanding of the main topics, uh, main concepts that were discussed and just have some awareness that, I don't know, exoskeletons um, um, and origami is can give some insight into how to make the robots more flexible and robust. Um, like this is, this is a line that you need to, um, or like this is a point where you need to decide it for yourself. And then like you basically say, okay, a second pass might be enough uh, for me. Or no, I need to go and do three passes. Or it might just be that uh, the first pass is just enough. I got the main idea about um, the article. Um, and then what I wanted a tip here uh, I don't know uh, what Rea thinks about this, but what I find sometimes very useful is to not read an article in the way it was organized, but rather go, okay, I'm at figure one. I feel that the caption is not enough. Then I'm going to read about it in the text. Then in the text, I find the equation too. Then I go in the theory part and look at the equation too. Then I need more context. Then I go to the introduction. So I don't necessarily follow um, the structure that they gave, even though like I can definitely tell that scientists spent a lot of time deciding uh, how to introduce the concepts such that you have enough background to understand the information. But sometimes it might just be useful for you, like if you want to understand a certain part of the article to go in a non-conventional way and in a way that 
works for you. Um, yes. So I think that this is um, we then um, is the reading exercise. So if there are any questions at this point, um, I think uh, it would be good. Like if there are any things that um, were not understand understood. Another question, um, sorry, is again, Jen, sorry if I mispronounce your name. We are also going to go through that um, because the question is, is it a good idea to take notes while reading the article? Mm -hmm. um, we'll go through that as well after the reading exercise. So yeah, stay tuned. OK, so for this, we um, uh, decided to do the quantum biology uh, paper, I said earlier, and we are going to do a first pass. Um, so just to remind you, um, we have like, we need to look at the title, the abstract, glance a bit over the figures and then look at the conclusion. So the way we will do this, we are not sure if it's going to work that well, but we are just going to go step by step and then maybe uh, we give you a bit of time for you to read over the text and then like maybe we can discuss, um, if there are any things that you don't understand or like I think that um, what are the most important or like what what are the pieces of the information that seem the most important to you. So first here um, is the um, uh, the title and the abstract. So we are going to look um, at this and just see try to figure out what what they are uh, trying to tell us. So like, I don't know, um, as you read, if you could uh, send to the chat, like sort of what are um, the main ideas that uh, you feel um, that are mentioned um, in the abstract or what are the main points that you take away? So just while people are putting things in the chat and uh, obviously just being a bit mindful of the time because we want to go until the end of the presentation. Uh, obviously, as you guys can see, because this is a review article, um, you see how the abstract is a very condensed overview of what you're going to be reading in the paper, right? So you see how they start with recent evidence suggests, which is giving you like an overview of what is you know currently out there um, and you see words like here we present both evidence for and against arguments uh, for you know and again like please feel free to ignore the jargon we're aware that this is you know very specialized knowledge that uh, you don't need to understand in detail but just so that you get like a feel for the um, how people structure their abstracts right And then like you can basically see so like one of the um, so they say non trivial quantum effects and then like you can see already that some of the most uh, the most important categories that they are going to mention are um, this light harvesting um, so collection of light then um, avian mag uh, magneto reception so this is to do like with um, basically orientation um, of birds um, and then also other examples. So like you could already ex um, expect that these are going to be uh, discussed. Um, OK, so maybe we can uh, go to the next point. So like this is like looking over the figures um, and also highlighted text. Um, so here, for example, as Rea said before, because it's a review article, they are giving um, references um, that they looked over in, uh, in order to make this review article. And they basically give also the main topics of the articles that were presented. So in the case of the photosynthesis, that this was related to the collection of light, the light harvesting, 
Um, these are all the topics that were um, considered. Um, and then same like with the um, um, avian, like sort of with the bird orientation, um, all the topics that were discussed. And for example, uh, highlighted text in this is you would be able to see that the sections are um, structured in talking about what are the quantum properties that are concerned, what uh, what is the rec recent progress of what uh, have people have already observed and investigated and what are still some open problems. So these are very good to give you like what is the current uh, trend at the moment in the field. Um, and then here for the point of uh, light harvesting, they are basically looking at, okay, what is the cellular um, structure? And they just try to give you a diagram of the main processes that are uh, involved, how the light is absorbed and how this influences the different uh, components of the, um, of the cells. Um, okay. So for the conclusion, um, this is um, quite a lengthy uh, conclusion, which might hint to you that they might also do a bit of discussion. They might compare um, the different um, results that they looked at and try to um, draw like sort of the main ideas. Um, I don't know if there are any messages um i'm keeping i'm keeping track yes, of the chat yep. the okay times there, there have been a lot of comments from people and i've just been like thumbs upping them yep. uh because you guys have, like very good points and i just wanted to go back to one of the questions um since you know it's like yeah quite important so uh the question is from sam at a level we are encouraged to be exhaustive in our approach to reading so with articles we can be more choosy and discerning Absolutely, Sam, like not just with articles, but once you go to university, you will realize that there is such a huge wealth of information coming at you and there's no way you're going to be able to like read through everything and like have that exhaustive approach, which is really good for, you know, A levels and for succeeding in them, but it's basically not manageable. Like the amount of literature that there is out there in every field and subfield is just humongous. Like there's no way you're going to be able to just like dive in, read everything from beginning to end in such a way that you understand every single thing. So absolutely, like you can be uh, picky in the sense that, first of all, as one was saying, you look at the main components of the paper, realize whether it's relevant for you or not, it could be partially re relevant and you just go through like those parts that are relevant to your specific project or the specific thing that you want to learn about. So absolutely do not feel the need to just read through everything and like understand everything you know it's first of all like you can't do it you know what i mean um but yeah it's just you have to be very strategic with how you uh spend your time and like what you dedicate most of your attention towards for sure and i was also wondering now i was trying to think uh back to university how how it started uh, or like back to undergraduate how how I started writing, uh, reading articles, because also like you also go through a phase where all the information that you need is in books and you don't really need to uh, read scientific articles. So for me, it was, for example, like in when we did experimental work, what they would do, it would be that at the end of, um, of the script that was presenting how you are going to go about the experiment, um, they would put some research articles that were related. So I first started by reading those. So it was already like literature review that was done by someone specifically for me and then or like specifically for the students. So um, and then basically from there, once you go to the article, like you may look at some other references, as we said before, like in case you don't understand something. So it's definitely it's def definitely a gradual change and you should not feel as if like you need now to be very thorough about re uh, reading everything in um, in the um, in the area um yeah so um just some some parts from uh, from the conclusion um so for example um and as mentioned earlier they um go all the way back to what were the initial questions 
Um, and what they wanted to look at was um, if the nature beats us in terms of uh, leveraging uh, quantum effects in order to make themselves more, uh, make uh, um, itself more efficient. And then they re uh, replied that they, uh, definitely nature can make advantage of some of this, um, take advantage of some of um, the quantum effects. Um, and they summarize, for example, like uh, the bird orientation, uh, the results for there. Um, and then they pose very importantly, and this has to do with the outlook, they pose then some other questions for future work, what scientists should look into. Um, and for example, like um, if it has, um, if there are any other fields where like quantum, uh, quantum physics might play a role, uh, for example, in biology, um, and they explain how one could go about it. Okay, so I think that um, this, and basically like you are encouraged to try to do the same thing for um, the engineering um, article and see what are the main topics or what are the main ideas that you can uh, basically extract uh, from it. Uh, yeah, so now I'm going to leave you with um, Rhea to tell us more about how we should go about our literature review. Well, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so by the way, please, if you have any other questions or comments, um, please keep them coming. One, I think you may have taken control back, but if you wouldn't mind, I'm just going to tell you to like click uh, because I think it's yes. easier. Thank you. Um, OK, so so far, just like an overview, we have been talking about you're given a paper, a review article or like a research article, and how do you go about reading that, right? So that's assuming that you already have the paper, someone gave it to you, like your teacher signing, whatever. As a scientist, when you start thinking about the kind of research you want to do and like the questions you want to address, it's up to you to do this literature search to find those like literature search, i.e. finding those papers as part of the research process, right? So like finding out what has already been done in the field, how people have addressed questions before, what gaps there are in the literature, so like identifying them and figuring out how you're going to fill those gaps, right? So first of all, how do you go about um, when you have those papers? How do you go about uh, managing them, right? Like so you want to if you could click for me, please. I, I can hear. I think you're muted. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, OK. So the issue is that I can't manage the. I can't uh, look at the um, chat fine, at the same fine. time. Yeah, OK, that's fine. I, I have the chat in front of me, so I can keep track in the meantime. OK, as well. cool. that's uh, fine. Perfect. Yes. So what are reference management softwares? This is assuming that you have this bunch of papers that you have found and we're going to go, you know, we're going to talk about this in the end, like how you go about finding them. But once you found those papers, how do you group them? Right? So like, for example, in my research, I have, um, you know, which is about like cell based therapies for type one diabetes. I have papers about like, you know, the background of the disease. So like from an immunological perspective, like what is type 1 diabetes? Uh, what are cell therapies? Uh, how do we make, a, how do we go about creating those cell therapies? So like the fabrication aspect. So they, like the papers that I'm interested in fall into like some discrete categories, right? And once I find those papers, uh, what if you could click on all of them for me, please. Thank you so much. Just, just all of them. So, there are certain programs like uh, reference management software that allows you, you to group paper to like download papers, uh, split them up into folders. And uh, then, for example, when um, if you have done any research projects in your um, high school experience, you will know you have to like cite everything. And um, so these programs can kind of help you generate bibliographies and put them either into Word or LaTeX, uh, which is kind of like a word equivalent that you code. Um, I, I don't know how many people will have experience with that. 
Uh, but these programs essentially make it very convenient to just keep track of your papers. Uh, someone asked about this earlier. If you want to keep any notes, if you want to highlight the papers, then these you can do this within these programs as well. So they, they're really helpful um, with their interface to allow you to do that. And some examples, uh, they include Mendeley, uh, Zotero, or Zotero, however you pronounce that, and EndNote as well. Next uh, slide, Luana, please. Thank you. So I, the one that I normally use is Mendeley, and it's really convenient because it offers a desktop app where if you can see, this is where I have all my papers, right, all my references, and then uh, you can store them either as just the reference or you can store the PDF version of the paper as well. And you can, as I said, organize them into folders. You can highlight them, keep notes. And something very cool about Mendeley is that apart from their desktop app, they also offer this web importer. So let's say you found some cool paper online, right? You can just click on that Mendeley um, browser extension that you that I have uh, circled in there, and you can directly import either web page or online document like papers into your Mendeley library on desktop, which is super convenient. Next page, Mona, thank you. And as I said, you can uh, incorporate these references in Word. So for example, let's say you have some placeholder, placeholder text and you, let's say you've made a statement, right? Like as you, as I'm sure you will already be aware, like you have to cite whatever claims that you make, right? So like if it's not your original thought, like then it came from somewhere and you have to like cite reference where that came from. So the way you can do that, if uh, you can incorporate this Mendeley site um, extension on your Word, and you can insert citations in text and also insert a bibliography according to your chosen style. And uh, this is, by the way, this is all um, free once you have like an educational email address and it's compatible with Windows, Mac um, and all platforms of the LibreOffice. I think that one aspect that it would be, I don't know, remembering from my um, high school projects is how, I don't know, is okay to cite um, websites? Because I see that you have here a link, for example. And how do you go about that? And which websites can you trust? And which, yeah. Yeah, yeah, obviously. Uh, I think most of these websites, because I just went like for an example, but uh, a lot of these websites also refer to, for example, where that uh, journal alt article was originally found from. But I mean, there are certain websites. So, for example, there are certain websites for microfluidics, which is, you know, microfluidics is like a whole field of uh, dealing with like microliter um, amounts of fluids. And there's certain websites, for example, which give guidance on how to fabricate those microfluidic platforms. So there's definitely like reliable sites that you can um, Site. So, for example, if you got certain protocols from a web from a website like that, you can cite it in your document. And obviously, like when there's Wikipedia, and you know that's kind of like not acceptable to like cite, uh, as I'm sure you will already be aware. Um, but yeah, so but Mendeley essentially allows you to cite websites and uh, all kinds of sources in your documents. Next slide, Wanna, please. Thank you. So the other thing, which is the final thing, and one of the most important things is you want to address a question or you've been given a research project and you want to start looking into the already existing literature, right? So like, how do you do that? So one tool that I really, really love to use when you want to find papers of interest is Web of Science. So what Web of Science allows you to do is if you have certain keywords, which is again, going back to the point that we were making in the beginning about why um, researchers have to be very strategic about how they title their papers. And like I saw one of the comments in the chat saying that quantum biology is not very helpful. Indeed, that's, uh, you know, that's case in point because people want to use a lot of keywords and you want to hit all those boxes for this paper to come up in searches, right? So like going on from the idea of the research and how you title your paper to, you know, being a scientist in your first year of PhD, just starting to like 
look into literature for like that field. So how do I go about it? Right. Let's say, for example, I have I want to find out like my project involves diabetes, microencapsulation and cells. Right. So like three keywords. So I enter those keywords in the search bar and uh, in this way, I'm searching through this database with millions of papers using these keywords. Right. And what I'm going to get from the uh, from the search is a list of papers or like publications or books, you, you know, wh whatever kind of publications, because uh, as we mentioned, like there could be, you know, many different types of them. And then what I can do is I can filter by year, which is especially, for example, in my field, um, bioengineering is a very rapidly evolving field. So, for example, something that came out in 2017 for me would be considered like old, you know what I mean? And I know this is like definitely not the case in other fields, which are kind of like more established, like, I don't know, mathematics and like physics, especially when you go to fundamental science. But in bioengineering, as I said, because it's like really rapidly evolving and really, you know, um, things, things move at a very fast pace. I, for example, could want to just sort out only papers from like, let's say the past three years, right? So I can do that. I can sort by researcher or like there's, you know, a bunch of different tools that can help you um, narrow down the literature search to papers that will be helpful to your uh, project. And then you can select them and you can download them or you can use your Mendeley, uh, you know, plugin uh, to directly import that in your um, database, like the local database of literature that you have in your Mendeley desktop app, right? Another question that we got. Um, next slide, you wanna please? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So yes, keeping track of literature. So the way I do this, and there's many ways to go about this, but uh, you know, just to give you an example. So with my papers, what I like to do is once I have them in my database, like here, they're um, locally in my laptop, for example. The first thing I do is like I title all of them in uh, standardized way. So what I do is I do year publication, uh, underscore research group, underscore journal. And I have this color code where I have all the papers that I've already read with a green ball and then all the papers I'm currently reading, but you know, a reading that is still in progress in yellow and then papers which I haven't read yet, but which are really important, you know, in the priority list to read in purple. So this is like kind of how I go, because once you find a bunch of papers, like trust me, once you go through Web of Science, like you're going to get humongous results, so, like which paper do you read first, you know, like the kind of stuff. So the way I try to structure myself is with this color code of, you know, knowing what I've already read and knowing what I'm reading in progress and knowing what's what should come next. Um, next slide, one please. Uh, yes, and I think I just wanted to say because probably it's very important, like which ones you select to make or um, to make them like be like, oh, this is very important. I'm going to read next is probably like you are evaluating from just reading the abstract or just exactly. reading like. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And also another question that we got earlier was uh, taking notes or highlighting papers, right? Also, this is how I do it. And there's again many ways to go about it. But um, as I said, you can use Mendeley to keep notes. What I want to like what I really like doing is highlighting papers and having a color code of how like I highlight the paper. So with blue, I try to highlight um, kind of like important information from this particular study or this review article, right? And then with purple, what I like to do is um, highlight very, very important key facts or figures in the broader context of the field. So not just for this particular study, but something which is very important. So like, for example, foundational background to like the disease or like how many people have the disease or how many cells do you need, to, you know, to like introduce a cure for type 1 diabetes? What kind of sugar levels uh, are considered normal? You know, the, the kind of stuff like very important uh, facts and figures which you should, you know, which you should know. Uh, in yellow, I highlight abbreviations, which was also something that was mentioned. You know, you get a lot of abbreviations which are usually only introduced once in the beginning and they kind of expect you to remember that. So I find it very helpful when the abbreviation comes up, I highlight it in yellow and then if I see the abbreviation again, it's very easy to go back and like find what that abbreviation was. Um, 
And then in pink, I like to highlight questions or contradictions. So for example, I've included like one paper here where I have all these uh, different colors in this section. So as you can see, like the abbreviation in uh, yellow and also like I had some something which was um, like it was a contradiction with another paper, so I've highlighted this in pink. And again, if you want, you can transfer this information after you're done reading the paper to a note keeping app of your choice or in uh, specific, you know, sections of Mendeley. That is kind of up to you, but it's, you know, it's sort of work to find a system which works for you. And I found the system which works for me, so I thought I'd share in case it helps other people going through literature search. Um, but again, very important by no means this is the standard of how you do it it's just one way to do it and yeah i think uh, so one aspect here i also like what i like a lot is after going through a paper and trying to understand parts of it especially if i need to write about it in a way like for example to acknowledge it in uh, in my research what i like doing is just to sit down and write in my in my own words uh, what I understood from the paper because then this gives you like what um, this gives you this what we were talking uh, about before like being able to try to explain the information as much or like um, to to improve explaining the um, information because if you are just going to take it exactly how it was explained and not pass it properly like through your uh, own filter it might um it might affect like i don't know how the information is presented to the next uh, to the next reader and it will definitely you are also going to see that it definitely also makes you question your understanding like when you are really sitting there and trying to write uh, to write down the most important things about about the paper yeah um so i think that yes this is the this is the, the last slide. slide so hopefully um you guys will have gained better understanding after this session of when you have a specific paper how do you go about reading the paper getting uncomfortable with things with you know having a lot of information and not like not understanding everything and just learning that's okay and like how do you meander you know around that um and then we try to you know give a brief overview into like how you go about finding those papers in the first place and then how you manage them once you found them and then some specific highlight a paper highlighting strategy so hopefully that's all helpful to you uh just reading through some of the comments uh, if you're writing a review article, once you read the review and research articles about the topic, how do you bring all the known information to create new conclusions in the review article without straying too far from the known research, but also not repeating the same information that has already been presented in previous papers? And how many ideas could you combine from papers without it being too isolated from uh, present research to be relevant? A very good question, uh, Ashley. Thank you for that. And yes, absolutely. Writing review papers um, is, you know, quite a big challenge, and usually they have like 300 references or more when you read them. So it's, it's you know, really like huge body of work and which is coming from people who have decades of. So, for example, the principal investigator, as we said, like the last author in the paper, they usually do quite a lot of work to guide their uh, PhD students or postdocs into uh, what to focus on. And it's usually those principal investigators with many decades of um, experience in the field uh, then giving their own opinion about like where the field is going. So trying to summarize what's already been done and like giving their feels based on their experience about like the future direction of the field. Hopefully that answers uh, the question somehow. And then Emily says, do you choose to subscribe to specific journals? Uh, personally, I've subscribed to, for example, you know how we mentioned nature and science. They, it's really interesting because they have their own kind of science briefing email so they give you like weekly emails with some of the most important publications uh like some of the most important advances of that week in science in many different fields or you can choose to subscribe to um you know for example get um notified when papers with certain keywords of interest to you come up and wanna if you have any like anything else please feel free to jump in yeah i uh, wanted to say this um, um, so on Google, you can even do this, like you can say um, to like send 
to send you emails. So for example, like there is also like Google Scholar uh, where people, for example, they have, so there is a professor or something like this and they have their research article. So what you can do, you can tell them, um, you can put on Google basically when um, they um, publish something in that field for you to receive a notification. What I wanted to say, and maybe like we haven't covered that well, is that a lot of these articles to have a membership, you need to pay for it. Once you are like part of a university, you are going to get access to these articles uh, through, um, uh, you are going to get access to uh, these articles through the university without, ha without having to pay. But what I wanted to say, I know that this is a bit like it depends from field to field, but for example, in physics, um, the archive is used a lot. So this is, I'm just going to post the uh, name in the chat, but basically this is a website where people, that is, um, the administration is done by Co uh, Cornell University and they basically post uh, the articles for free there. And this very, in um, physics, I know that is um, a field that is, um, an, sorry, it's a website that is quite well appreciated um, and it's trusted, but I know that in biology, like there is, for example, uh, people don't appreciate it that much because they care a lot about the peer review. Like usually what happens in physics is that you first po post your research on the archive and then you send it to a journal and you go through um, to the peer reviewing process. But uh, the archive, you can basically get access to the articles for free. So you might get one in nature, and uh, let's say that you see the article in nature, but then you can look it up to see if it is available on the archive. Um, yeah. Uh, sorry, just provide, yeah, one of very good points actually. Just want to check with provide, like, uh, do we have a hard stop? Can we just have two minutes answering the last questions or? Um, yeah, just just two minutes then because we, we're reaching yeah. time now, yeah. Um, Ayesha, Ayesha, sorry again if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, absolutely, you're not going to be required to remember all the contents of the paper, which is why it's good to have like a good reference uh, management software or a good system of taking notes such that you remember at least the most important points or at least what the paper was about and then you can go back to it at some point. Ashley, um, as I said, my research specifically is based on uh, developing a cell based cure for type 1 diabetes and it's very like, you know, kind of touches upon immuno engineering, biomaterials, tissue engineering, very interesting uh, topics which I'm going to be touching upon in the frontiers of science program. Hopefully you're going to join for that and sorry, I don't have time to elaborate more and um, thank you so much guys for coming. This was super useful. Thank you for the questions, the comments and good luck with your studies. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Juana and uh, Raya, for that really fascinating and very practical and helpful session. So just a reminder, everyone who's been here tonight will receive the recording. And um, please do check the link I put in the chat if you are interested in any other of our science talks. So thank you and good night. <laughs>